healthcare as normal healthcare that is a part of a reproductive person. Uh, so um, anyone can be pregnant should have a right to abortion. And that's how I see it. So in my mind, while saying I'm an abortion provider, I'm a doctor who provides abortion, uh, I'm actually quite proud of that label. So you are welcome to call me that. I'm saying I just, you know, you do a lot of things. That is one thing uh, that you do. And I understand absolutely. I'm not saying it is a scarlet letter. I'm saying I just didn't want to limit you um, and try to play to some full controversy. The, the idea of why pregnancies are ended, the concept is, well, you need this law because women just use this like contraception. Um, they don't have to have it. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. All these babies would have been perfect, and they just killed them for no good reason. In your experience, what comes through these operating rooms in terms of why the abortions are necessary? We see patients for a vast, vast list of reasons. That could be anywhere from having other children that they need to care for. It could be someone with medical comorbidities where the pregnancy itself puts their life at risk. Um, there are some medical conditions that have upwards of a 30% risk of mortality in the setting of uh, continuing a pregnancy. There are patients who are in poverty, who don't have the financial means to continue their pregnancy and choose to parent. There are patients who are diagnosed with fetal anomalies, which usually doesn't occur until well into their second trimester. For all of these reasons and many, many more, we care for these patients and we see these patients every day. So, Doc, what happens now? It's a great question. Um, we are keeping our clinic doors open in any way that we possibly can. We are complying with the restrictive laws that are now in front of us. We knew that this was likely a reality. We've been planning for this. Um, it's devastating. It is heart-wrenching to have conversations with patients who present to us either unaware of the law or aware of the law, but we're right on the cusp of six weeks and we detect cardiac activity and we have to tell them that we can no longer provide them the health care that they have the right to. Dr. Gilbert, I appreciate your frankness. I appreciate uh, your experience in this situation. Thank you for taking this opportunity. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll be right back. Our challenge was to determine the best ways for our citizens and visitors to safely enjoy the Tokyo they know and love. Tokyo is a fascinating city that integrates both tradition and innovation. As governor, my first duty is to keep Tokyo safe. We cautiously monitor the global and local situation, consulted experts on safety measures and began to apply new policies so Tokyo could begin to open. As we prepare for travelers from around the world to visit again, we look forward to welcoming you and hope these new measures make for a safer and happier environment for everyone. Africa special from sub-Saharan startups to South African powerhouse exporters. Asian and African companies collaborate to expand their brands into new markets to operate in some of these countries' unique logos. 
who understand customer cultures, we explore successful businesses and investment opportunities that are bridging connections between both continents. The Africa Asia Profit Point, Saturday on CNN, in association with Dango Tay. says there are about a hundred Americans left in Afghanistan. I don't know if that number's right. I don't know where they get it, but that's the number. We do know that they say that a majority of the Afghans who worked alongside our military were left behind. Now, if you've been watching this show, you know we've been following. And one person in particular, Sarah, we've been using her for a metaphor of this movement. She's an American. She was an interpreter. Her life is in danger every second she's in Afghanistan. So far, she and so many others can't even get anyone with the State Department on the phone. But they've been lucky. Sarah has been lucky. She was able to turn to veterans who've been putting together what you see online called hashtag Digital Dunkirk. They're working stateside with groups like Allied Extract and folks like my next guest to find ways out of Afghanistan for these people. So let's find out about Sarah, and also a new question. Is the State Department trying to stop the work of these veterans who are helping people like Sarah? If so, why? Harvey Graham Green joins us now. Welcome to Prime Time, and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. First, uh, let's start with Sarah. What do you know about her status? <sighs> Sarah is safe. Uh, her and the children are safe. We are continuing to do everything that we can as a group to keep it that way. Uh, for operational reasons, I can't go any deeper as of now, but we are doing everything that we can to keep her and the children safe, and they are currently safe. Last thing I want to do is compromise her safety. Now, Harvey, help me with this. And I know uh, this can be sensitive. It's less sensitive for you because uh, you don't have U.S. reservist restrictions on you and fears of the chain of command. But I have heard several accounts now from these NGOs and uh, these digital Dunkirk types like you, that you're doing the logistics, you're raising the money, you're getting the people, you're getting them someplace, you're staging to take them out, and then you are being told you can't by some government agency, the Department of State, the FAA, something else. Is that true? Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely correct. The, the fact that I'm on here tonight speaks to this. Um, one of our US combat veterans um, or was due to come on, but due to pressure he's facing from his chain of command, he asked me to come on because I'm more impartial. Um, at this point, we are a group of group. Uh, we're linked together by people like Sam Rogers under his leadership. We're achieving the impossible daily. We're even at a point where we have aircraft to partner organizations, something we could have dreamed of five weeks ago. But the, the issue at this point is we need somewhere to land this aircraft. Um, charter flights coming out of Afghanistan, it's, it's, it's not a new thing, it, but it is an emerging situation. Um, we need someone to land the aircraft. At this time, the State Department are not only um, blocking that, but they are also putting into place other restrictions, such as placing cease and desist orders on NGOs. Um, as it stands, with everything that we've done, with everything that our people on the ground are achieving, doing the impossible every day, 
the last piece that we need to put in place, the thing that is stopping Sarah from coming home, is the fact that the State Department will not give us anywhere to land our charter there. Let me let you hear what the State Department said about this today. We understand uh, the concern uh, that many are feeling as they try to facilitate charters uh, and other forms of passage out of Afghanistan. Uh, the fact of the matter now is that we do not have personnel on the ground. Uh, we do not have air assets in the country. We do not control the airspace, uh, whether over Afghanistan or uh, anywhere else in the region. Does that work for you? <laughs> I mean, the, the first call out here, Chris, is the fact that if they had fulfilled their promise to the evacuation and got everybody out by August 31st, this wouldn't be a conversation we were having. Uh, in terms of security, there are plenty of US airfields in the region where these aircraft can land and the passengers can be screened safely, get their first night to sleep without fear for probably weeks, and then can come home back where they belong in the US. I understand that wider security is concerned. Flights out of any region which has an active ISIS presence or any other localized terrorist group, that, that is a threat we see across this region. But that, that is not in itself reason enough to, to stop flying American citizens out that we have left, well, the State Department has left in Afghanistan. Uh, have you had any indication that things will change in terms of your ability to get Sarah out? We, we've had no indication that there is any willingness from the State Department. Um, workarounds that have been looked into by our partners, especially landing in third countries, uh, permits have been denied, and a source within the State Department has told us that that is due to pressure being applied by the State Department. Harvey, uh, as I said to everybody I've been working with on the Digital Dunkirk side, uh, one, it's not like you're just some bunch of nobodies. Uh, almost all of you have an aspect of military uh, intelligence work and veterans work where you understand the processing and you know these people involved. So it's not like you're coming at this uh, blind, uh, but you have my number. I will be always a text away or a call away, and we are going to put pressure on the State Department starting yesterday. Harvey Graham Green, thank you very much, and good luck with your work. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for our support and being on board. Absolutely. Somebody's got to do it. Listen, I'm going to go to break on this, um, but people in the government, I know you're listening. This is one of those situations where when these situations, not if, go bad, and people were waiting, and it can be traced back to you not doing something because you don't have the process because it doesn't fit how you usually do things, you will regret it. We'll be right back. Air quality update in association with Copernicus. Europe's eyes on Earth. Oh. with Copernicus, Europe's eyes on Earth. Dear 
general. Excellence. Simply delivered. Singapore has set an ambitious target for producing 30% of its nutritional needs by 2030. With the support of DBS Foundation, we have developed close to 270 of these urban farms and gardens to produce food for the community, thus cutting carbon emissions. In this way, we can really create a strong foundation for the future of urban farming in Singapore. These are the portraits of purpose we're enabling at DBS Bank. The journey to the top for a successful business in Africa starts with an idea. But how does a concept become a moneymaker? African and global industry leaders share their stories this weekend on Profit Point in CNN Marketplace Africa in association with Dangote. Or a classroom of second graders. I was definitely excited. A president and a moment that forever unites them. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center. Now, 20 years later, there's only 16 of us with him. We get to be the people that tell the story. Do you think that that day affected who you are today? CNN special report from Road History of the 9 11 classroom on Monday on CNN. The world's fourth. World's fourth. The world's fourth. I'm Quinn Wyatt. I'm Amanda Davis. I'm Andy Schultz. I'm Don Rodell. I'm Alex Thomas. I'm Patrick Snell. And this, this, this is CNN. mistake we can't turn away from stories like the killing of Ahmad Arbery you know you deal with it in the flush and then you move on so almost two years now this case is finally going to trial and now beyond the men charged in his death the former local prosecutor who initially declined to press charges has been indicted herself we can't let these cases fall aside so let's bring in Lee Merritt who's representing the Arbery family counselor thank you for joining us once again uh, were you surprised by the indictment, and what does it mean for you in the overall sense of justice? I was surprised because it's unprecedented. Precedent. I've never seen a prosecutor uh, who failed to bring charges, who, who, who helped actively participate in the cover-up of, of misconduct, indicted criminally themselves. Uh, what this means for us first is a signal, signaling to other prosecutors uh, that if they are not forthcoming with the evidence, if they somehow participate or put their finger on the scale of justice that they can face consequences themselves. But for the family, who you have to know when this first had happened, and you've had one on the show many times, uh, that's who they went to, the, the local elected prosecutors to say, who's gonna be held accountable? And she was left in the dark for 72 days. And, and so this was a big relief to her because she was as offended by that as she was uh, by the murder of her son. Also, um, the idea of what do you believe the prosecution will show. The prosecution will show, uh, the question is in regards to the McMichaels or in regards to Jackie Johnson? Jackie Johnson, the DA. Oh, okay, with regard to uh, Jackie Johnson, what was presented to the grand jury was first evidence that Jackie Johnson had a relationship uh, with, with Gregory McMichael, the, the father of the shooter, Travis McMichael, that immediately came to the case. The first phone call that Gregory McMichael made from the scene of the shooting was to Jackie Johnson saying, I'm in trouble and I need help. Oh. And instead of uh, opting out and saying that she had a conflict, oh. she called the, the subsequent prosecutor, George Barnhill, and began to discuss and get his advice.